Thank you, members. Questions without notice. Call the Leader of the Opposition, Ms Lay. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Transport and City Services. Minister, in relation to light rail stage 2A construction, you were recently quoted as saying that, and I quote, it's going to mean a significant amount of congestion that our city probably hasn't seen before in its history, end quote. You went on to say commuters' options could include using public transport. Minister, under the massive levels of traffic congestion and disruption you have warned us about, how will public transport perform any better than a private motor vehicle? Mr Steele. Well, I thank the member for her question, Madam Speaker, and of course our government is getting on with our city's largest ever infrastructure build, which is focused on providing better public transport for our city building a more vibrant, sustainable and connected city in the future as our population grows. And as we do that, we've been upfront with the community that this is going to have a significant disruptive effect while we construct the project. And that's why we've established the Disruption Task Force, a task force that will be looking at how we can minimise the extent of that disruption to the community, not just those businesses and people that live, uh, work and uh, go for recreation around the western side of London Circuit, but also in the broader community as well. And that's why the Disruption Task Force is looking at better public transport options. They're looking at a range of different things, which I've said and been very clear that we will announce over the coming months. In addition to that, they'll be looking at behaviour change, encouraging uh, shifts in the way that people uh, work. People will have to rethink their routes, rethink their routines during the period, and we'll be clearly communicating with the community and business every step of the way as early as possible about the options that will be available so that they can uh, reduce the impact on themselves and help to keep our city moving as well. And our government will be putting in place the infrastructure investments that we can in the short term on our road network to reduce the extent of disruption. So that work is ongoing and the, the group has been meeting uh, for some time as we undertake significant preparation and planning ahead of work starting later on this year. Supplementary, Ms Lee. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, you're going to create additional <laughs> bus lanes on Kings Avenue, Parksway and Mooreshead Drive to allow public transport to operate better on these routes? Mr. Thank the member for her question. And we are considering a range of different options to provide uh, public transport as an option, as a way that people can help make their commute into the city and into the parliamentary triangle easier and help minimise the disruptive effect that the construction will have as we seek to build a, an infrastructure um, system with, with public transport that will which, which will benefit Canberrans for generations to come. So all options around public transport are being considered and I've already announced that we're looking at things like park and ride, uh, we'll look at bus priority of course. We'll also work with groups like Pedal Power on how we can uh, encourage people to use active travel if it's appropriate. We also understand that for many groups in our community, many people, um, particularly families, some of these options may not be appropriate. Um, but if we can encourage enough people to, to use these options, then it will help to keep our whole city moving, as well as, of course, shortening the commute, uh, making it easier to get into work and to where people need to, need to go, such as schools. Mr Parton. Thank you, Minister. Is it your intention to ban private motor vehicles altogether from certain congested routes? And if so, which routes? Mr Steele. No, Madam Speaker. Our focus is on minimising the extent of disruption during this infrastructure build. As we seek to build uh, light rail and get on with what we said we would do, creating over 6,000 jobs, connecting light rail um, from uh, Civic to, to Woden. And we're going to deliver a much better uh, public transport system for the future. That's the best way to encourage people to use um, public transport. Of course, as we do that, there will be some road closures that are required, and we've been upfront with the community, and the maps are available on uh, the Light Rail Project website. The clover leaves uh, in the south uh, west will be closed uh, to traffic, and that is going to have a disruptive effect. Uh, on, on traffic, and that's why uh, there'll be other routes that people will need to consider to get into work if they need to use those uh, exits. Uh, and we'll be making that very clear, often on a daily basis to the community, about where we're up to in the construction program, which roads are closed, uh, which roads are open, 
uh, to use, and that's going to change as the project continues, Madam Speaker. The early works will begin very soon on utilities removal, and that will only have localised uh, disruptive effects. But as we move into quarter two of next year with the raising of London Circuit and the demolition of the bridges in a staged fashion uh, over London Circuit on Commonwealth Avenue, that is going to have a major disruptive effect. But it's also the effect of the work that the NCA is doing on the uh, bridge augmentation on Commonwealth Avenue as well, as they seek to extend the life of that bridge for, for another 50 years and also widen the uh, pedestrian and cycling um, uh, bridges as well to provide better active travel opportunities. So we'll be working hand in hand uh, with the NCA, but these are not the only other major infrastructure projects happening around Canberra. We're planning for, uh, to make sure we can minimise disruption around all of those, as well as the private developments uh, that are occurring around our city. Mrs Jones. Oh, thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Transport and City Services. Minister, Canberrans residing on the south side of the city have been advised to consider using the Monaro Highway as an alternate route once light rail traffic disruptions occur elsewhere. Around the same time, construction will start on the Monaro Highway upgrade with major activity in 2022. To make matters worse, your traffic disruption modelling indicates light rail works will generate a 46% increase in traffic loads on the Monaro Highway. Minister, why are you telling people to use the already congested Monaro Highway at the same time as you will start disruptive works on the same road? Mr Steele. Well, we're not, Madam Speaker. Um, we're getting on with building uh, major infrastructure projects that are needed to meet the needs of our growing city. And we are getting on with works, uh, of course, on light rail uh, very soon, but also getting on with the necessarily necessary infrastructure projects on major arterial routes like the Monero Highway, like William Hubble Drive. We're also building a hospital in Woden. We're getting, building a new interchange at Gus Depot in Woden, a new CIT campus. There's a huge amount of private development occurring right across the city, and it is going to be a disruptive period, Madam Speaker, and that's why we're doing the preparation and planning necessary so that we can provide closer to the time uh, advice to Canberrans about uh, what routes they might want to take to minimise the extent of that disruption. We haven't provided that advice yet, um, Madam Speaker. We'll be doing that um, close to the time, and it will depend on where each of the infrastructure projects is up to in its program. Uh, and that may differ often on a daily basis around uh, which roads are closed and, and so forth. So we're getting on with that work, and it would be extraordinary if it was the position of the opposition Liberal Party that we should delay and not build these projects, we're getting on with the job. Time yeah. order. Yeah. The Minister is both debating and has still not answered the question, which goes to relevance as well as debating, the question being, why is he telling people to use the Monaro when it will be congested at the same time? Uh, I think he's covered his response to that. It certainly has not. Uh, no need for a chat back, Mrs Jones. It is indeed. Thank you. Minister, will the works on the Monaro Highway be taking place at the same time as the upgrades to Stage 2A? Mr Steele. Yes, Madam Speaker. We'll be getting on uh -huh. with making sure that the yes. Monaro Highway yes. is safer and will be and reduce travel times on that important yes. connection, not only for uh, Tuggeranong residents, for, for, but for the whole yes. of the region, yes. Madam Speaker, including uh, Jerobombra, yes. South Tralee, uh, Queanbeyan, uh, our major freight route um, to the southern part um, of New South Wales. We're getting on with that work and we're going to get on with all of the other infrastructure projects that we've committed to, uh, because that's what our Labor and Greens government does. We've committed to these in our infrastructure plan, which clearly outlined all of the major infrastructure projects that we, would, uh, that we will be doing over the coming years, and we're getting on with the job. And that is in stark contrast to what the Liberal Party has done, which is to put in jeopardy every step of the way major infrastructure projects the like that. The question with the Campbell, it was the Minister is debating. He's not, Mrs Jones. Supplementary, Dr Patterson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, Minister, I was wondering how um, the Disruption Task Force will work to inform commuters of all these roadworks. Mr. Steele. I thank the, Dr. Patterson for her supplementary, and we'll be communicating through a range of different channels about uh, as the as the build uh, commences, about how people can best get into the city, uh, what the progress is on the project, 
Uh, it'll be through radio, uh, it'll be through anyone that wants to sign up for updates through the Light Rail website. We've of course established members. We've established a community reference panel that I met with the other day that has representatives from the entire uh, from a range of different stakeholders in the community. We've established an accessibility reference group, Madam Speaker, in Transport, Canberra and City Services, and we'll be consulting with them on the accessibility aspects of the project. And we'll be providing uh, information through stakeholders that often have quite a large membership um, so that they can disseminate information to their members that might be pertinent to them, how they can get into the city on a bike. Uh, during the construction um, period if they'd like to. How they can use public transport, the Public Transport Association will no doubt be very helpful there. How we can work with business to make sure that they can accommodate more flexible arrangements so their employees can get into work uh, and not be held up in traffic. Uh, we'll be working with the entire Canberra community and that's why we have established the, the Disruption Task Force to get on with that preparation and planning now well ahead of this major infrastructure bill commencing. Members, questions without notice? Mr Hanson. Yep. My question is to the Chief Minister. No, I'll give it to the <laughs> Minister for Transport and City Services. He deserves one, but not today. <laughs> Minister, you were recently quoted as saying that light rail stage 2A would cause traffic congestion never before experienced in Canberra. Given survivability in life-threatening situations is directly linked to emergency vehicle response times, Minister, what contingency plans have you made for emergency service vehicles attempting to access life-threatening situations during this period of traffic congestion? Mr. Well, I thank the member for his question and as I've uh, stated to the Assembly today, we are undertaking a significant amount of preparation and planning as we uh, undertake preparations ahead of the light rail stage 2A project occurring, which will start with utility works in just a few months' um, time as we seek, uh, seek to build a very large infrastructure project which will keep people moving around our city and hopefully reduce congestion uh, on our roads. That's the premise of this project. And we'll work with agencies, including emergency services, to make sure that they have all the information that they need, that they're working with us to around the uh, planning for the project. And once we've got a delivery partner on board, Madam Speaker, for the major elements of the uh, construction build, we'll of course work with the delivery partners to uh, make sure that there are measures in place to ensure that people can appropriately move around, including emergency services vehicles, through uh, areas where the construction is affecting uh, the city. But we expect that the major impacts of this construction will occur during peak times. So in the morning in particular, in the AM peak, uh, and, in the, and in the evening. And so um, they are the, the times that we're focusing on. Um, we don't expect there to be as much traffic disruption in the other times. But all of the work that the Disruption Task Force is doing around infrastructure improvements that we can put in place on roads to ensure that we've got good movement of traffic behaviour change to reduce uh, the demand on our road network during, during the peak by spreading it out. And all the work that we're doing around public transport options and active travel options will all help to keep our city moving during this major infrastructure build. Supplementary. What traffic simulation modelling have you done specifically on emergency vehicle prioritisation during the light rail project and will you table any modelling in the assembly if you've done some? Mr. I thank Steele. the member for his question and we've already uh, released the, uh, some of the outcomes of the traffic modelling that we've uh, undertaken on what the traffic would look like if we didn't take any interventions at the moment. At the moment we're looking at the interventions uh, and of course a significant amount of traffic modelling is ongoing uh, that will look at those interventions, what impact they can have across the, the road traffic network in Canberra. So, We'll continue that work and we'll continue to liaise with the other agencies Final going board, forward. I'll resume your seat. Just on relevance, Madam Speaker, the question was specifically on emergency vehicle prioritisation, the traffic s simulation modelling referring to emergency vehicle prioritisation. And I um, would just ask that the Minister be relevant to that question. Well, he's relevant to modelling and he's made mention of Thank the uh, activity. The question, Thank you, Mr Hanson. You have a supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, what smart technologies has the government investigated to prevent emergency service vehicles from being stuck in traffic congestions caused by this light rail project? Mr Steele. Well, we've, I've already said that we wouldn't rule out any options in terms of how we can 
help to manage uh, the disruption during the, the build. Uh, and we'll work with emergency services around what their requirements are in terms of uh, access around the road network uh, and make sure that we reduce the amount of disruption overall in the city to make sure that we can keep all uh, traffic moving uh, throughout the city during a very uh, what is going to be a very challenging time for the city, but will provide long-term benefits for our city and for Canberrans for generations to come. Questions without notice? Mr Pedersen. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health. Minister, there are many changes underway at the Canberra Hospital campus. Can you please update the Assembly on the work that is being undertaken as part of the Canberra Hospital expansion? Ms Stephen-Smith. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank Mr Pedersen for the question. Well, as members would be aware, the contract with Multiplex to deliver the new critical services building as part of the Canberra Hospital expansion was signed on the 29th of June. And with today's announcement of the development application being approved, this important work continues for the future of our health system. Another milestone day for this project, Madam Speaker, that would not have been achieved if the Canberra Liberals had been elected last year. Main works on the project have, com have commenced. Relocation of, if you were, after being elected last year, you would have already built it. Uh, relocation of in-ground utilities have been completed and Multiplex are continuing their investigative works. Internal demolition to Building 5 commenced in July, with complete demolition of Building 5 and 24 scheduled to be finished by the end of 2021. Quite different from the hole in the ground we would have gone into the pandemic with if the Canberra Liberals had had any say in the matter. Big hole in the middle of Canberra Hospital we would have had going into the pandemic if the Canberra Liberals had been in charge. This comes on top of a range of early works, of course, Madam Speaker, that have already transformed the campus. The new Building 8 was completed in July 2021 and provides upgraded facilities for the Canberra Sexual Health Centre and, of course, staff training. In addition, 12 apartments were refurbished in Building 9 for short-term accommodation at the Canberra Hospital for interstate outpatients and carers. And of course, at the former CIT site in Woden, we've provided 750 car parking spaces for hospital staff and contractors, freeing up spaces on the campus and, and will deliver 1,100 parking spaces in total. Construction of the temporary prototype shed and the contractor compound also commenced in June with the prototype shed scheduled for completion early next year and that will allow staff and consumers to test out the functionality of proposed spaces for the new building to ensure those designs are fit for purpose. Mr Pedersen. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, what does the opening of Building 8 at Canberra Hospital bring to the Canberra community and the staff who work there? Ms Stephen Smith. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank Mr Pedersen for the supplementary. Well, the opening of Building 8 has been an important milestone in the modernisation of the Canberra Hospital campus through the expansion project, providing new facilities for the Canberra community and health services staff. Uh, the much-loved Canberra Sexual Health Centre, eh, maybe that's not the right term for it, has been relocated <laughs> to a modern purpose-built clinic on level four. But I know that Ms Chain is a big fan of Canberra Sexual Health Centre. Uh, the relocation of the Canberra Sexual Health Centre supports the work of providing um, sexual health services pro for priority populations with a focus on prevention, screening, early diagnosis and treatment of sexual tra sexually transmissible infections and HIV. The Sexual Health Centre continues to offer an important COVID safe services with shorter uh, in-clinic waiting times. Light and spacious, this new space in Building 8 has been warmly welcomed by staff and consumers. Canberra Health Services also has a new, new purpose-built teaching and training facilities for all staff located on Level 2 and Level 3 of Building 8. The new teaching spaces provide a modern environment to attend essential education. The education spaces include four flexible training rooms for large and small groups, computer access, a specific space for occupational violence and manual handling training, and a simulation space for clinical skills training, which I know that Mrs Jones will be pleased to hear. The new Surgical Skills Centre is a purpose-designed and built facility aimed at the skills training requirements of our Canberra Health Services health workers. The area encompasses private study space, tutorial rooms and two clinical skills laboratories, one of which is equipped to handle wet specimens and tissue. Building 8 also houses important research units to bring education and research together on the one floor, encouraging increased collaboration. The co-location of education and research means we can measure training effectiveness and provide the community with the assurance that CHS staff are accessing the best evidence-based education possible. Ms Hall. Ms Hall. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, how will planning for the Canberra Hospital ensure an accessible and integrated approach is taken to future-proof the campus for the Canberra community? Ms Stephen Smith. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank Ms Orr for the supplementary question. Well, the ACT Government is, of course, currently working with stakeholders and community to develop the Canberra Hospital Master Plan. The Master Plan work provides a roadmap for the next 20 years of development of our largest hospital. The Master Plan looks at how all elements of the campus can fit together, including through the Canberra Hospital expansion, to improve experiences for everyone. Phase two of the Canberra Hospital Master Plan is currently out for consultation is currently occurring after opening on the 23rd of July 2021. Major themes heard in the first phase of consultation included access, accessibility and connectivity. Incorporating this feedback, Madam Speaker, we've developed a precinct-based approach to the campus with two draft options of how the campus could potentially develop over the next 20 years to get people's feedback on those specifics. We encourage all Canberrans to visit the Canberra Hospital Master Plan Your Say page or attend one of the pop-ups at your local shops. The team has also been out and, about, out and about at all community council meetings and I was pleased to attend Woden Valley Community Council last night to see their presentation there and hear the questions from the community. We want to hear what the community uh, has to say and where, about how we can improve the Master Plan options as we go work towards finalising it. Through the master plan, we've identified opportunities for improved access for vehicles and pedestrians, integration of active travel and public transport, upgraded wayfinding, and increased and improved open spaces, including green spaces across the Canberra Hospital campus. Parking, of course, Madam Speaker, is also a very important issue for the community, and the master plan options demonstrate increased parking supply can be provided more evenly across the campus. This includes providing parking under the new buildings as redevelopment occurs, and allowing the community to directly access areas of building in an efficient and safe matter, manner. The master plan is about identifying potential redevelopment and ensuring progress on the campus has the guidance and flexibility it needs to support the best model of care and service delivery. Your time delivery. has expired. Questions without notice, Mr Parton. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Chief Minister. <laughs> Chief Minister, yesterday in question time, when the opposition asked you about correcting your false statements about thousands of warning notices being issued following speeding limit or speed limit changes in Civic, you said that doing so is not the top issue. You also confirmed that no one from your office or directorate informed you that your statements were false. Chief Minister, since these revelations, have you instructed your office or directorate to audit your appearances on Chief Minister's talkback for any other false or misleading statements. Andrew Barr. No, no, whilst uh, obviously uh, Chief Minister's talkback will uh, throw up the widest variety of issues, I think from last week's uh, episode, everything from our relations with China uh, to speed limits uh, on Northbourne Avenue uh, to the usual uh, municipal service issues, uh, vaccination programs. Uh, it was a very wide ranging uh, forum, as it normally is. Uh, so we make every endeavour to answer every possible question that we can on the spot. There are times uh, when I just do not have the information in front of me uh, or in my head, Madam Speaker, uh, and so I will take things on notice. Uh, and there are other times, clearly, when it is possible uh, that human error can occur, and that was the case last week. I've apologised for that. Uh, and you know, from time to time, we all make a mistake or two, Mr Parton, and you, of all people, <laughs> today, <laughs> Supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Chief Minister, have you received any other briefs or advice from your office or directorate about false or incorrect statements that you have previously made during media appearances? Mr Barr. Uh, well, in my entire career, <laughs> uh, look, from, I, I, I recall, uh, yes, over more than 15 years that there have been times I have misspoken, Madam Speaker, uh, occasionally in this... Occasionally in this, occasionally in this place, and uh, and sometimes in media interviews, uh, uh, you you identify an error, Madam Speaker. I uh, think the appropriate thing to do is to apologise and correct the record, which is which is uh, what uh, I have done on multiple occasions when uh, when something has been drawn to my attention, Madam Speaker. Mrs. Kickett. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. Chief Minister, why is it not a top issue for you when to many of the 18,000 who received a $300 fine, it is a big issue of affordability? Mr. Barr. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Ms. Kickard, for the question. Uh, as I outlined uh, in my response yesterday, uh, we are in the midst of a global pandemic. Uh, there are hundreds of people in hospital just a couple of hundred kilometres up the road from us. The virus has spread uh, outside of the Greater Sydney area. Uh, this is my number one priority at the moment, responding to the pandemic, addressing the vaccination rollout, ensuring uh, that we deliver our budget at the end uh, of this month, Madam Speaker, continuing the ACT government's engagement in the national cabinet process. Uh, we are continuing to focus, Madam Speaker, the, 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 the national cabinet process is of course broader than just the response uh, to the initial uh, and impending issues associated, uh, associated with the pandemic. We continue to respond to climate change, Madam Speaker, which is an urgent priority. We continue to respond to the need uh, to build more houses uh, in this city, which is another urgent priority. We continue to provide support to the tourism and hospitality sector, uh, Madam Speaker. We continue, uh, we continue our focus uh, on emergency services, on police, ambulance. Uh, we continue to deliver healthcare services in the community, Madam Speaker. We focus on the rollout of new infrastructure uh, across the city, Madam Speaker, including public transport projects. Uh, we, are, we are, of course, Madam Speaker, Mrs. Continuing, Jones, Mr. Hanson. Uh, continuing to deliver on our election commitments. Uh, and, Madam Speaker, uh, we remain focused on the number one priority that faces this community and this nation at this time, time responding to the pandemic. We'll go to more questions without notice. Ms Clay. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Planning. Minister, the expansion of Kipax Fair has been of great interest to the Belconnen community. My recent visit with the Umbagong Landcare Group raised flood risk due to climate change as a particular concern. To what extent does the 2020 KIPAX flood report take into consideration data based on the new climate change risk environment and the impacts of flooding we're likely to see over the next 100 years? Mr Gentleman. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank Ms Clay for the question. Uh, I'll go to the KIPAX study first and just advise that we took under uh, substantial consultation in developing both the KIPAX Group Centre Master Plan and the Associated Territory Plan Variation. The flood study done in 2015 informed the processes for the Master Plan and the Territory Plan uh, for KIPAX as well. And we did an updated flood study from 2020, providing additional information to government. Uh, so that study took in, uh, into account the changes we've seen most recently, some, of course, which have been uh, uh, associated with climate change, were taken into account as well. Now, that revised study considered a number of uh, change conditions, more recent survey and updated parameters and methods uh, as contained in the recently revised National Flood Guideline, uh, which is the Australian Rainfall and Runoff uh, Guideline 2019. And the 2020 flood study found that the land uh, is suitable for development. Supplementary. Minister, has a strategic environmental assessment been conducted in the last 10 years to look at flood risks and flood mitigation at KIPAX, given our changing climate? Mr. Gentleman. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank Ms. Clay for the supplementary. Well, the, the flood study that we did uh, is publicly available, all, all parties seeking to express interest in the site uh, through that uh, recent expression of interest can go and have a look at that too, and of course members of the, the public can have a look at that. Uh, I'm confident that they've, they've taken into account, uh, as I mentioned earlier, changes that are occurring. And indeed, we're looking at this uh, uh, situation in whole of government circumstances too. I can say with ESA, they're looking at changing uh, conditions and are moving to an all hazards approach when it comes to uh, emergency services responses uh, across the ACT. We have seen changes in weather. Uh, we've seen it personally um, as citizens across the ACT in the last couple of years, Madam Speaker. Uh, so we'll certainly keep an eye on uh, those predictions and ensure that they're well embedded into our future planning. 
Sup Mr. Braddock, supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, our strategic environmental assessments conducted for all major urban developments to help future-proof us in the context of the changing climate. Mr. Oh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, yes, assessments are taken into account for uh, the future of developments. Indeed, uh, uh, some of the work that we do around our bushfire operational plans and bushfire abatement zones are a key way of expressing that commitment. Uh, we need to make sure that, of course, our city is safe as we grow into the future. And it was certainly one of the considerations that we took into account uh, when we looked at the uh, strategic uh, planning for the ACT and the announcement of our 7030 change to the way that we will develop Canberra into the future, Madam Speaker. Questions without notice? Mr Davis? Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for the Environment. Minister, throughout the colder months, many Canberrans have been lighting up their wood fire heaters to stay warm. But I've been contacted by several of my constituents who are concerned about the adverse health effects of wood smoke, particularly in Tuggeranong. What is the government doing to manage the nexus between the needs of Canberrans to heat our homes while also protecting Canberrans from the adverse health effects of wood smoke? Ms Fazeroni. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Mr Davis, for the question. Um, yes, it is the case with winter coming on, people are using a, a range of ways to heat the, their homes, including wood fire smoke. And, um, Members of this House might have noted that we did release the 2020 um, air quality um, report um, quite recently, which did identify um, that particularly in the winter months that, that while we have really good air quality, wood fire smoke does create some issues for um, both in terms of environmental impacts as well as health impacts. So the ACT government does um, take this issue really seriously and we are looking as part of the um, smoke and air quality strategy that we are developing um, in consultation with um, ACT Health and other parts of government to really look at whether or not we've got all of the measures in place. So at the moment we certainly do monitoring and um, I'm really also pleased to um, let the House know that um, in April this year, environment ministers came together and made a variation to the ambient air quality national environment protection measure to actually ensure that we had strengthened air quality standards for ozone, nitro dioxide and sulphur dioxide to ensure that what we were monitoring was, in, it was, um, was of, the highest, of the highest standard. We also provide an, um, a wood heater um, replacement program for people who are interested in, um, in, in replacing the wood fire heaters and we offer financial incentives for the removal and disposal of wood fire um, wood burning heaters um, and particularly additional incentives if, that they, if they are putting um, more efficient electric, electric systems in place. We also look at, at some areas because of typology, we know that they are particular risks and in those areas, particularly in, um, in places such as the Malongo, they are, there are some service, suburbs that they're unable to um, put wood fire. Supplementary, in. Mr Davis. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, what specific government programs or subsidies exist for Canberrans who currently own and operate a wood fire here, heater, but they would like to transition to an electric heater? Ms Bazzarotti. Thank, thanks, um, the member, for the question. Look, there's two key things. Um, we I, I did, in my previous question, talk about the Axmart wood fire heater replacement program. And so that provides a range of rebates. Um, if you're removing a wood fire heater, um, an additional re um, rebate if you're removing a wood fire heater and putting a reverse cycle air system in and, um, and, and, and those, um, depending on what you do, what you put in, you'll get a different rebate. Also, the, um, the recently announced sustainable household scheme, which will will offer zero interest loans of between 2,000 and 15,000 to support eligible households with living more comfortably. We'll also provide mechanisms for people to replace their wood fire heaters. Mr Parton. Is the demand for wood fire heaters steadily increasing despite the measures that you've outlined? Ms. Bazzaroni. Yeah, thank, um, thank the minister for the uh, thank, thank the member for the question. <laughs> Sorry, I almost gave you a promotion there. Yeah, uh, thank you for thank you for the question. Um, it, we have heard some reports that there is an increase in wood fire 
in wood fire heaters, and, and, and certainly there might be a, a number of things driving this. The really good news is in relation to particularly new wood fire heaters, in terms of very string, stringent regulations, um, that there, this, there is a much more reduced um, impact on the environment and health if people are, are putting in a new wood fire heater. Um, but we will continue to work through a range of our um, education programs in terms of encouraging people to really look at more um, other, other forms of heating that are better for the environment and don't have the impact on health. Questions without notice, Mr Milligan. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Transport and City Services. Minister, in relation to light rail stage 2A construction, you said that it's going to mean a significant amount of congestion that our city probably hasn't, haven't seen before in its history. In another statement, you suggested that much of the traffic would be diverted from Commonwealth Avenue to Kings Avenue and Parks Way. Minister, how can you tell the public to use these roads when they are already particularly at a standstill in peak times already? Mr Steele. For his question, uh, well, Commonwealth Avenue, we've been very clear, we'll probably see an 80% reduction in its use, and that's because people will choose to use other roads to get more quickly into the city. Uh, and Parksway will be a major uh, one of those, as well as um, Kings Avenue as well. Uh, we're looking very closely at what uh, improvements could be made to Parksway uh, as part of the work of the Disruption Task Force, as well as other um, road improvements in the network to make sure that we can reduce um, travel times, uh, deal with the capacity issues. And we do expect there to be more vehicles uh, in peak times on those roads, and that's why we're looking at behaviour change as well. So spreading out the peak, spreading out the volume of traffic using those roads so that we're not seeing everyone using them at exactly the same time. So as I've outlined uh, very comprehensively to this place, uh, that work is ongoing. We'll make further announcements uh, down the track, but in the longer term, we are looking at, at Parks Way very closely, and of course, with the federal government um, funding 50-50, um, we are looking at what future improvements need to be made to Parksway generally. As our city grows, it is a major east-west corridor in our city, and we want to make sure that it uh, can make sure that it has the capacity that is needed to carry a city of 500,000 plus in the future. Mr Milligan, you Thank have you, a Madam Speaker. Minister, what analysis led you to believe that Kings Avenue and Parksway have the capacity to carry their share of 4,100 vehicles per hour that will be diverted from Commonwealth Avenue in peak times. Mr Steele. The traffic modelling that we've undertaken, a mesoscopic operational traffic model of the city and inner north uh, that we have looked very closely at, uh, the volume of traffic that is likely to be on those roads. And now we're looking at what interventions and what measures we can put in place to help mitigate and minimise the disruptive effect on the traffic uh, network, and that is the work that is underway now, and I'll be announcing further measures about uh, what that will mean for the traffic network over the coming work, over the coming months as we undertake the preparation and planning that is needed for this major infrastructure project, which you have fought against now at two elections and have now tried to put it in jeopardy again over the last month. Members, can we swap the chit chatter across the room? Mrs. Jones. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I'll change it better. Uh, Minister Steele, will you table the mesoscopic study that you referred to? Mr. I thank the member for her question. And the mesoscopic model, I have tabled the, uh, the results of that, that study, Madam Speaker, and uh, I table it again. Here it is. <laughs> On point of order, Madam Speaker. Point of order, the minister was asked if he would table the study in its entirety. He has not actually answered the question. Members, I'm giving Miss All the call for her, sub her question without notice. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Education. Having just celebrated Early Learning Matters Week, can the Minister please outline the impact that early learning has on child development? Ms Berry. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I think I can speak for every parent who has uh, their children attending an early childhood centre, the impact that it has on every child uh, is outstanding and the early years of a, of a child's life are just so exciting. 
every day learning something new, experiencing something new, imagining something new. And around 90% of brain development occurs in those first five years of life. Child development is driven by interactions with other people. High quality early childhood education plays a critical role in supporting children to learn. For children experiencing vulnerabilities or disadvantage, this education plays an even more significant role turning the curve on inequality. High quality early childhood education can have a substantial and sustained impact on a whole range of skills that are important for children's future including improved social and emotional skills and a head start in developing literacy and numeracy skills. That's why, Madam Speaker, it was so important to spread the word during Early Learning Matters Week, which was last week, and to thank Baringa Early Learning Centre in my electorate of Ginandera for inviting me to celebrate this important week with them. Supplementary, Ms Orr. Your Minister, what is the ACT Government doing to support early childhood education and care? Ms Berry. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Last year, I launched the ACT Government's Early Childhood Strategy, Set Up for Success. Set Up for Success was developed based on overwhelming international and national evidence on the importance of quality early childhood education, particularly for children experiencing vulnerability or disadvantage. The keystone initiative in Set Up for Success is the Government's commitment to provide every three-year-old in Canberra access to one week one day a week of free early learning by the end of this term of government. This will be a major step forwards to our goal of providing 15 hours a week of free quality early learning for three-year-olds. Already every four-year-old <coughs> in Barron has access to 15 hours a week of early childhood education under the National Partnership Agreement. And the ACT government has now funded 15 hours, it continues to fund 15 hours a week of early learning which will be targeted to the three-year-olds who need it most. Supplementary, Dr Patterson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, how is the government supporting early childhood educators? Ms Berry. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, this is the most important part. We know that educators are absolute key to the high quality early learning provided in early childhood settings. This is recognised in the National Quality Framework, which acknowledges the importance of staffing arrangements in the provision of high quality early childhood education. The ACT government's Early Childhood Degree Scholarship Program provides people working in early childhood education and care with financial assistance to get their degree qualification. The program provides up to 25,000 per scholarship, plus funding for providers to backfill the staff member. As part of the Set Up for Success strategy, the ACT government has established 16 communities of practice between ACT public schools and early childhood education and care services. These communities of practice are an opportunity for early childhood educators to share their expertise with public school teachers and improve outcomes for young people. The ACT government is also providing training for early childhood educators to support children who have experienced trauma through online modules and webinars. I look forward to continuing to implement the Set Up for Success and I support every early childhood educator who gives every ch Canberra child in those services the best start in life. Questions without notice? Mrs Kickett. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Transport and City Services. Minister, TCCS recently announced the imminent closure of two major parking areas in Civic one on the corner of London Circuit and Constitution Avenue and another on Marcus Clark Street. We are told these will be lost for several years, further exacerbating the chaos you will soon impose on people who work in or who need access to Civic. Minister, how many parking spaces will be lost to Canberrans dependent on these for their livelihoods? Mr Steele. Thank the member for her question. I'll take the um, exact detail on notice, but what I can say is that as we undertake this major infrastructure build, which is so important for the future of our city, there will be some disruption in relation to parking as we um, set up um, sites to site compounds um, ahead of the construction, starting uh, firstly with the utilities works, the early works, and then later with all of the other uh, bills. And there will be further site compounds uh, needed in the future on various parts of the route down to Woden uh, as well. The, the site compounds that are um, that you have particularly focused on on Marcus Clark Street and in the southwest corner 
uh, of the car park on London Circuit are only a, the one in the southwest corner is only part of the broader uh, surface car park. Um, over recent years, we have seen a significant number of um, car parks come online in Civic, and that actually has resulted, together with other circumstances like people working from home, in there being actually quite a large number of car parks in Civic at this present time. So we think that the current number of car parks that we have in Civic, both public and private, uh, can manage um, the demand for parking uh, appropriately while we undertake uh, this major work. But of course, we'll be continuing to monitor uh, the effects on parking. Uh, and these two site compounds are critical for us being able to get on and, with build, and build this important project. Mrs Kickett, supplementary. Yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, given that parking in Civic is already full, where are you expecting people to park after these closures and will you table the whole mesoscopic study you have referred to earlier? Mr Steele. I thank the member for her multiple questions. Uh, in relation to the, the, um, the, the parking issues, I reject the premise of the question I've just said. We expect that there is capacity um, for parking in Civic. Uh, regardless of what is taken in relation to the site um, compounds, uh, and so people can find other parking uh, else, elsewhere. It may mean they have to park in a slightly uh, different location, uh, for example. And I've already just tabled the outcomes of the mesoscopic model that I mentioned, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, why will you not table the entire mesoscopic study referred to earlier in question time? Mr. Steele. Well, I thank the member for his question, and um, of course, we'll continue to be undertaking various different modelling throughout the process that Disruption Task Force is in, engaged in, and looking at how we can uh, best minimise the disruption as we build this incredibly important infrastructure project for our city to better connect. Uh, Canberra's south uh, with the city centre yes. uh, to deliver Can you better. Seat, please, Mr. On relevance, the minister was asked a very simple question, and he has not at all answered it at all yet. And it was whether he would, why would he not table, not what other work is going to be undertaken or is currently being undertaken. What is what what is the reason why he will not table it? Madam no, Speaker, I've already un already tabled the outcome of that model. Oh, yeah. yes. Thank you. Thank you. On relevance and on the Minister's response, this is absolutely disgraceful that he will treat the Chamber like this. Yes. We have asked a very straightforward question and he refuses to even entertain the question. That is not what the standing orders ask him to do. Madam Speaker, on the point of, but I, I'm happy to continue answering the question if, if you like rather than just sitting down. Um, this is a complex operational traffic model. And to, to, to the points of order. Um, I believe he's on track, and if you're going to raise behaviour of members in this chamber, I'd look to your colleagues very closely, Mrs Jones, to talk about what's acceptable and what's not. Madam Speaker, on your feedback, thank you very much for it. Nonetheless, commentary across the chamber is one thing, but I actually think it's a really serious matter if he will not answer the question in any way, refuses to actually make the explanation of why. Yeah. Well, the, minute, the speaker can also pause. Well, the Madam time. Speaker, in closing, with 16 seconds to go, um, this is a complex operational traffic model, and uh, it does change depending on what the inputs are and the, and the assumptions around the model. But I have tabled the um, the modelling that we've undertaken uh, based on the assumptions that we've um, provided. But there will be ongoing work, Madam Speaker. Questions without notice. Ms Kessley. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Transport and City Services. Minister, in relation to light rail stage 2A construction impacts, you recently said the Disruption Task Force would, among other things, focus on minimising the impact of construction on business. Minister, what risk assessments did you undertake in relation to the impact of four years of construction activity on businesses in affected areas of civic, and will you table those assessments? Mr. Steele. I thank the member for her question, and we're continuing to uh, work with business to um, understand uh, what their needs are during the build, and of course we'll work with them as we get a better understanding of the uh, construction program once we've got a, a delivery partner on board for the various um, parts of the project. We, of course, started to engage early, and it was one of the learnings from stage one of uh, the light rail project to engage. Uh, at a much earlier time to understand the extent of the businesses and other organisations that go beyond business uh, on the light rail stage two alignment, uh, who they were, 
um, and to start engaging with them through a variety of different channels, uh, regular updates um, provided by email, uh, engagement face-to-face. -face. We've had several pop-up sessions, including um, just in the past um, month. Um, with them, I've been meeting with the business representatives, um, uh, including the, uh, the chamber, as well as um, women in business. Oh, and they are represented also on the, um, the stakeholder reference group for the um, project, which will feed into the project as we go through the construction period. Uh, we undertook an assessment of light rail stage uh, one, which looked at the learnings um, for business. And what we heard from business is that they want early and clear communication so that they have certainty to plan for um, what's going to happen during the construction um, period. Um, it is going to be a disruptive um, process for businesses, particularly on the western side of London Circuit that operate there. Uh, but the, of course, the flow-on effects with the traffic disruption um, could affect broader sets of business. So we're engaging more broadly with the community and the business community uh, on those. Um, and we'll have more to say on that as we progress with the project uh, and the project um, disruption task force work. So we know that this is a critical part of work and the partnerships that will need to uh, be formed going through this process are going to be critical so that uh, business has the information that they need to be able to get through this challenging period. Time has expired and you get your supplementary, Ms Kathleen. Madam Speaker, why have you only engaged with the business community rather than engage in detailed risk assessments early? Mr Steele. Well, I think the member for a question. In fact, we are actually we are actually taking a range of different assessments in, in relation to this project, uh, and how we engage uh, with business. And we'll be uh, conducting survey work with business. We've been talking with them face to face about uh, what they'd like to see uh, during the project, and we'll be taking that on board as we uh, go through this uh, project build. And it's something that will benefit the businesses along the route as well, Madam Speaker. And that's um, very clear. Um, this is going to be a project that will provide better public transport access to the western side of London Circuit, where predominantly the businesses operate. Um, it probably won't have as great an impact in some senses as the Gungarland project, which um, is right in the middle of the, the business centre. Um, but it is going to provide a significant benefit for uh, business in the long term, and we want to make sure that they can actually harness those benefits as part of this process as well. Uh, Mr Kane. Uh, Minister, what compensation will you provide for businesses that are forced to close and for people losing their jobs as a consequence of several years of disruption? Mr Steele. I thank the member for his question. and um, it, It's pretty unusual to provide direct compensation for uh, businesses to while we're undertaking major public infrastructure work that is going to benefit the city and benefit businesses. Uh, we're getting on uh, with the work that we need to to engage with businesses and what we've heard from them is that they want clear information early so that they can make better decisions and that was a key learning from stage one and that's what we'll be doing, engaging uh, with them over the coming uh, weeks and months, Madam Speaker. Mr Kane. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And my question is to the Minister for Transport and City Services. Minister, you recently announced that during the construction of light rail stage 2A, there will be considerable disruption to traffic flow around Civic due to works to raise London Circuit. Minister, when did your government first become aware of the extent of traffic disruption that Stage 2A would cause in Civic and its approaches? Mr Steele. Well, I thank the member for his question. And of course, we are aware that a major infrastructure project is going to create a disruption. I mean, we just built light rail Stage 1 a significant infrastructure project that had some quite significant disruptive effects. Uh, it involved a building in, in the middle of Gungarland CBD. It involved major intersection uh, track being laid across major intersections along Northbourne Avenue. Um, but this is the first time we knew this when we made the decision that... Uh, Resume we'll be seat, Mr Steele, your point of order. My question, Madam Speaker, was specifically when did the government first become aware of the extent of traffic disruption? Well, I think the Minister's right. going to that detail, the, Mr Kane. There's no question. point... I've been clear that we always knew that this is going to be a disruptive process because you can't build a major infrastructure project without having some sort of impact on, um, on the road traffic network in... in case of light rail that runs on the road Harry, reserve. Um, so this, of course, is part of the planning and the work that we're doing um, around looking at the traffic modelling uh, has, of course, provided more specific um, numbers around 
that and, and we'll, it is ongoing in terms of what it will uh, look like once we put in place the interventions to minimise that the extent of disruption as well. But the reason that we're raising London Circuit, and it's pretty obvious that this, this project would have a, have a major effect, is because we want to raise London Circuit up to the same level of Commonwealth Avenue, not only to provide an access point from London Circuit onto Commonwealth Avenue for light rail, so that it can get down to Woden, but also to provide much better access from the city to the southern part of the CBD and to the lake for pedestrians and cyclists. So that there isn't a six metre high wall in the way that blocks access um, between key parts of the CBD. So it, that is going to be a very disruptive part of the project, but it's a decision that we made for the long-term benefit of the city so that we've got a city that is walkable. Mr Kane. Uh, Minister, given the monumental scale of disruption to traffic flow, why did you not mention this until after the election? Mr Steele. Madam Speaker, it is very clear that these major infrastructure projects have uh, impacts, but the community also knows that they have very long-term benefits for the future of the city, and we've now brought this to two elections, two elections that you opposed it. And now it seems that the Liberals want to oppose it again, based on an obvious premise that this is going to have a disruptive effect. But at every stage, we will try and minimise and mitigate that disruption uh, during the infrastructure bill. We'll work with the, the infrastructure delivery partners to make sure that the way that they design their program mitigates as much as possible the impact on our, our traffic network. We don't want to see people uh, sitting in gridlock, and that's why we're undertaking the measures that I've announced around infrastructure improvements, around behaviour change, better public transport and active travel options so that we can give Canberrans choices and opportunities to get into work as fast as possible and keep the city moving while we build this important infrastructure project that will benefit Canberrans for generations to come. Ms Casterly. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, why are you imposing years of massive disruptions all for the sake of making commuter times from Woden almost 50% slower? I Mr. reject the, the premise of the question, Madam Speaker. And it's, it's really disappointing, Madam Speaker, um, to hear this from Ms Castley, because this is a project that is going to benefit Gungahlin residents. It is a Gungahlin to Deakin project. It is a Dixon to Deakin project, Madam Speaker. Dixon to Woden, whichever way you cut it, this is an extension of the line from the north to the south. It's going to provide a mass transit line. Four times the number of people can fit on a light rail vehicle compared to a bus. And this, for the first time, will open up public transport stops between Woden and the city that do not exist up until Albert Hall. There is no way to get on a bus between, between those points or to get in. Uh, on State Circle to access the Parliamentary Triangle and the employment hubs there, to access the Deakin Employment Hub. This will provide a mass transit system for our growing city, an integrated tr transit system with our bus system uh, serving the suburbs. This is the significant future-focused investment that our government has taken to the last two elections and has been backed in by the community. Bitterly fought elections where you fought every step of the way against these projects and they rejected your view of the world because you don't stand up for your own communities in Gungahlin, in Woden, Mrs Jones. We're getting on with the job of providing better public transport, more environmentally friendly transport, a more vibrant city. We're going to build light rail and create over 6,000 jobs that you would not do if you were in government, Madam Speaker. Members. Mr Brunning, question without notice. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is for the Minister for Justice Health. Minister, with the recent lockdown of Goldwyn Prison, I'd be interested in what the ACT government has doing to ensure that the people in high-risk environments, such as the Alexander McConaughey Centre, are protected from COVID. Ms Davidson. Uh, I thank Mr Braddock for the question. Uh, Justice Health Services has been working quite closely with Canberra Health Services vaccination coordination team and also with ACT Corrective Services to facilitate a rollout of vaccinations at the AMC. So it's very important that we make sure that people who are most at risk in our community have access to vaccines. Uh, the vaccines uh, rollout at the AMC commenced on the 1st of June of this year. Um, as part of stage 1B of the COVID-19 vaccination rollout. 
Um, and as of the 27th of July, 55 per cent of people in the AMC are fully vaccinated against COVID-19, and a slightly higher percentage have had their first dose. Um, ongoing COVID-19 vaccination clinics are being conducted each fortnight to vaccinate uh, new people who are coming into the AMC. Uh, and uh, when people are released, if that happens prior to receiving their second dose, they're being provided with information about where they can get their second dose of the vaccine um, so we can make sure that they are able to uh, make sure that their health needs are covered. Um, people who are in the AMC are invited to uh, have a vaccine. They can choose not to have it. Uh, but so far, people uh, in the AMC have been very appreciative of having the ability to be vaccinated. Mr Brodick. Minister, could you please provide an update on the vaccinations for First Nations people who are detained in the AMC? Ms Davidson. Uh, yes. So people in the AMC who access their primary health services through Wenunga Nimitija Aboriginal Health Service are also included in the vaccine rollout and they're able to access their vaccination uh, while they're at the AMC through Wenunga. Um, having personally uh, talked to the clinical uh, staff at both Justice Health and Wenunga, uh, the staff there have really appreciated being able to provide this level of care to people who are in the AMC. Uh, they're very, uh, very appreciative of being able to get access to the vaccines and make sure that people at risk are protected. Uh, and I want to thank Justice Health and Wenunga for doing all that they can to make sure that people are offered the opportunity to be vaccinated while they're there. Mr Davis. Minister, when will the vaccine rollout in the AMC be completed? Ah, Mr Davidson. <coughs> yes. Uh, so the initial rollout was completed, uh, the first round was completed on the 9th of June, uh, which was only eight days after it started. Um, and the second round of vaccinations commenced on the 29th of June. Because people do come and go from the AMC, people are released and, and new people come in, that's why it's important that Justice Health are able to run those fortnightly clinics so that new people coming in are able to receive their first vaccination. And also why it's so important that if people are released before they have time to have a second vaccination, that they're connected up with health services in the community. Um, and one of the great things about Wenunga is that people who are in the AMC can continue to see Wenunga for their ongoing health care after they're released, which is great for continuity of care and something quite special within Australia that we have that service available to people in Canberra's AMC. Questions without notice. Dr Patterson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Transport and City Services. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Minister, how is the ACT government providing community space for Malonglo Valley's growing population? Mr Steele. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank Dr Patterson for her question. I'm pleased to outline how our government is continuing to invest in new community facilities across our city. And community facilities do provide essential social infrastructure for new suburbs and regions and ensure that these places grow to become strong and connected communities. And this is precisely why we are focusing investment in Canberra's newest region, the Belonglo Valley. As I outlined in a response to the ministerial statement earlier this week, the Belonglo Valley has grown from around 27 residents in 2011 at uh, the census to 4,500 residents in the 2016 census and approximately 10,000 residents today. And we'll get a better number hopefully next year once the census uh, is released. Our government is making the essential investments now that are needed in anticipation of future population growth. And recently, I was very pleased to announce that the government will provide 300 metres squared of space at the Coombs Community Activity Centre for use by residents of the Malonglo Valley in Wright Coombs and Denman Prospect, as well as the future Malonglo suburbs. Located on Woodbury Avenue, this space will be a hub for recreational, educational, artistic, social and cultural activities and will be one of the main community spaces in Malongolo while other facilities become established. We're pleased to have identified this opportunity to provide a temporary facility ahead of construction of purpose-built facilities in the future. Madam Speaker. Supplementary. Minister, what are the next steps to make this space available to the community? Mr Steele. Sure. As I alluded to in my previous answer, the space will be adaptable to cater for a wide range of community activities and services. And as the government became aware of the possibility of leasing this facility, we engaged with the Mongolo Community Forum. 
and as it was then known uh, before it became a community council to gauge what community groups would like to, how they'd like to use the new centre, when they'd like to use the centre, the types of programs and activities uh, they'd like to use it for. And I think the forum for running that expression of interest process, which received feedback from a large number and variety of groups. And it's good news for those community groups because the Community Activity Centre will allow for up to 100 people to meet in a flexible space. And over the coming months, the ACT government will undertake a fit out of the space to make it ready for community use in early 2022. And while this fit out is occurring, the government will be, express, will be seeking expressions of interest for a community organisation to act as the venue manager and organise bookings for the new space as well. I look forward to keeping the assembly updated as this important community facility progresses, which will be available over the next five years for the community to use. Mr. Pedersen. Uh, Minister, what other plans are there for community spaces in the Mwanglu Valley? Mr. Steele. Pedersen for his supplementary, and in addition to the two local public schools, which are available for community use, um, there are five community centres that have either been built or under construction or being planned for Canberra's newest region. In addition to the Coombs Community Activity Centre, our government has just proposed that a new community centre be built and handed back as part of the Coombs and Wright Village on Fred Daly Avenue. This would be a government-owned facility that can be made available to the community once construction is complete. In Denman Prospect, the Denman Village Community Centre is well under construction and will soon be complete, I understand, sometime around March next year. This centre will provide a purpose-built space for community groups to be managed by communities at work and will include an early childhood education and care service as well. And as ACT Labor promised at the election, we'll also build a new library and community centre at the future Malongolo Commercial Centre and we'll undertake a community co-design process to get an understanding of what they'd like to see as part of that facility. And lastly, Madam Speaker, Stromlo Cottage has played an important role as a local hub for the Valley's first residents. It's currently undergoing some maintenance works and so that it can accommodate even more community groups, which is the fifth community centre that I've uh, listed. So there's going to be certainly lots of spaces in the future for the residents of the Malonglo Valley as they seek to build a vibrant community in their new homes. Mr Barr. Pay more attention, Madam Speaker. During the end of question time, I'm happy to ask that all further questions be placed on the notes. Thank you, Mr Barr. So are there matters arising from question time? Mr Hanson? Uh, Madam Speaker, in accordance with Standing Order 213A, I seek leave to move a motion ordering that Mr Steele table the full mesoscopic study by close of business today. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Uh, uh, for those who are unaware of this standing order, 213A, uh, if there is a document that is uh, referred to in the Assembly, and as it has been by Mr Steele, which is the mesoscopic transport study, uh, there's an ability for a process whereby a motion is moved. Uh, now, have I moved the motion, Madam Speaker? Do I need to do that, or have I just got leave? You I'll move the motion. I move the motion uh, in accordance with 213A, seeking uh, that. Uh, Mr Steele tabled the full mesoscopic study by close of business today. And I would ask that that is circulated to members as well, but we'll take it as moved at the moment, sure. members. And so the question is that that motion be agreed. Mr Hanson, I think he's still on his feet. Mr Hanson? Yeah, I've moved the motion. I'm, OK, yep. you're finished. Uh, so uh, as members, uh, if they refer to the standing orders, there is a, um, a process whereby if the Assembly uh, supports a motion that a document be tabled, that that be tabled uh, to, the, to the clerk, uh, should the Chief Minister believe that there is privilege attached to that document, uh, it be Cabinet Conference and so on, he can uh, make that case. Uh, and there is a process that then unfolds where that can be contested and an independent legal arbiter be appointed by the clerk to make that assessment. So there is a process that follows. Uh, the reason that I'm asking this document is that this is a very important issue for our community, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, the government touts this as the uh, most significant infrastructure project in the history of the ACT. It'll be many billions of dollars to do this. Uh, and as the government has outlined already, uh, there are going to be some significant disruptions caused by this project in terms of closed car parks, 
uh, and then a significantly constrained uh, routes. Could I seek uh, your uh, guidance if Mr Hanson's motion is in accordance with the standing orders, particularly listing the time for production, given that Standing Order 213A6 provides 14 days to claim privilege? Yes, but I think what we're doing is moving the motion. Descend depends on the Assembly's response to the motion, what actions then follows. Yes, yeah, that's correct, Madam Speaker. My understanding is that if my motion is supported, uh, then Mr Steele uh, could put that document forward. But if the Chief Minister believes that there is uh, privilege attached, he would then make that case and then there's a process that unfolds. So the first decision is for this Assembly either to support the motion or not. If it does, then that process follows where the Chief Minister would say there's privilege or not. It's up to him. Uh, and if a member would dispute that, then, then that, at that point there's an arbiter uh, appointed. So the question is whether we think we should see the document first, I suppose, is, is the point, and then we would look at whether there is privilege and so on. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I've said the end of business today, uh, but members, I'm, I'm, I just want the document, and if, if you're saying we'll give you the document if you give us a specific period, I'd be very happy for that to be delayed. The, by the end of business today is less important to me. But the reason that we want it is this is a, an issue of great significance, and you've told us that. We all understand that. And this isn't just short term. This is going to go on for many, many years. Uh, and when we asked for it in question time today, Mr Steele tabled what he said was the summary, which from what I could see was a single piece of A4 paper, half of which was a picture. Uh, now, if we're talking about detailed transport studies, uh, I think it's reasonable if the opposition is going to be able to do its job and if the people in the community who have great interest are able to look at this, uh, that they... Um, they can do so with all the information for them. So it's pretty straightforward. Uh, I don't think there should be anything to hide. There shouldn't be anything to hide, but should the Chief Minister think at some stage that there are privilege, there is privilege attached to this document, there is a process that unfolds. So look, I, won't, I won't go further than that, other than I, I, yeah, I think it's in the interest of the government to be as open as it can in these matters. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, look, there's obviously a number of issues that have been raised that are problematic with the wording of Mr Hanson's motion in terms of the uh, claim of privilege and otherwise. So I would suggest, and I will move, that we adjourn to a later hour this day so that a correctly worded motion could be put before the Assembly. The government will then consider, uh, but it's quite likely that we would uh, claim privilege on this matter, but I will... Uh, I will need to take some advice on that and in accordance with the standing order that was written for this very reason, there is a time frame. So uh, I think the, uh, a, a preferential approach for Mr Hanson would be to, uh, to remove the by close of business today element and simply call for the tabling. That would then uh, trigger the standing order in its, uh, in its entirety because it will not be tabled today uh, given I will take advice uh, and, and would, would then seek, uh, most likely seek to claim that executive privilege uh, as has been the case before. But in order to ensure that this can be dealt with in a, uh, uh, in a more appropriate manner that's not making it up on the run with handwritten motions, uh, I move... I move, I move that the debate I move that the debate be adjourned to a later hour this day, Madam Speaker. So the question is that the debate be adjourned until a later hour this day. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. So we'll come back at a later hour today. Are there other matters arising from question time members? No. We'll move through to papers.